Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. First of all, my, this is Alessandro Palombo. I'm the CEO and co-founder of JUR. And today, I would like to thank, thanks Benedetta for, for the invitation. Uh, I'm quite honored to be here to, to introduce to you this, this panel of uh, exceptional academics today and uh, to give you immediately um, an overview ho of about who they are. Uh, on my right, uh, there is Professor Amedeo Santososo. Um, he has been um, the president of the first chamber of Court of Appeal of Milan. So he, I think he has a quite huge experience in uh, dispute resolution, I would say for a few years at least. Right? <laughs> and uh, he's professor of law, science, and new technologies at the University of Pavia. And he's also involved in uh, the World Commission on the ethics of scientific knowledge and technology at UNESCO. So thanks, uh, Professor, for being here today. On my left, we have Jean Lassegue. He's a researcher in the uh, CNRS, and he focuses on both uh, philosophy and the history of computer science. So I think we will go, thanks to Jean, um, deeper on uh, giving, providing to you an overview of why computer and law, which probably originally were two totally different topics, today uh, are being and becoming uh, always closer and closer again. More on the left, there is uh, Dr. Pietro Ortolani. He is a researcher in Radboud University, and he published several articles about dispute resolution and blockchain. We came in touch, I think, a few months ago, and then also we, we are doing um, some, some interesting experimentation on, on this topic in, uh, in his university in Nimegen, Netherlands. So uh, thanks to all of you to be, for being here today. I would like to start this, this conversation, so please uh, feel free to uh, stand up and uh, to, to, to ask uh, and interrupt us if you have questions or you want to, to, to ask uh, um, someone, someone, someone of us about some specific angles of, of this topic. I'm going to start uh, doing my questions to Professor uh, Santososo. Um, actually taking inspiration from the title of this conference of today. So there is a huge innovation about technology. Who and how is going to, to decide about, for example, disputes when we, we talk about smart contracts? So you have been a judge for, I think, more than 30 years? 40. Oh, 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 more than 40 years. So who is going to be the judge on blockchain? <laughs> well, thank you, Alessandro, for your uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to uh, Professor Boschiero and Benedetta Capiello for the very kind invitation. And I followed the uh, preparation of this uh, meeting, discussing uh, very often with Benedetta, uh, but I did not imagine that the final result would have been so nice, so interesting, so provocative, and uh, compliments to the uh, organizers. So let's go straight to the, <coughs> to the issue. Uh, this is uh, one of the main representation of blockchain, and how a smart contract can work within a, a blockchain. So you have a user request for a transaction, a block representing the transaction, the block is bro uh, broadcasted, and then all the nodes uh, uh, validate the block, the block is added to the chain, the transaction gets verified and executed. Wow. Champagne. <coughs> so, my question is, uh, and if things go wrong, what about? What are we going to do? What is the solution? What is, so the, the question, uh, if we compare the situation today with some years ago, two, three, four years ago, is completely different. Uh, uh, today, the question is on, on, the, uh, on the table is on the table. And there are some official initiatives. This is an initiative by the UK. And so they launched a public consultation. They have a good experience of this kind of public consultation. Uh, and they are very good. The starting point uh, by the chair of this uh, group is that smart contracts will only finally take off when market participants and investors have confidence in them. 
So the problem of confidence in the tool. And mainstream investors still need to be convinced that their legal rights can be protected when they trade in crypto assets and enter into smart, smart contracts. And parts of the technology <coughs> sector have suggested that contracts written in code have no need for legal superstructure. We discussed this also yesterday. But the investors' uh, confidence would grow significantly if it were clear that crypto assets were property in English law, okay, creating binding legal obligation. And mm, <laughs> this is a, a point. So the, uh, they launched the, um, this uh, panel. Uh, and the goal was to overcome the legal uncertainty. They want to a uh, well, clear uh, legal uh, scenario. It is quite ambitious, uh, I have to, to say. Okay, so at the moment we have uh, strategies for regulation. We can have states rules, we, we can have international rules in a uh, broad sense, including uh, EU legislation, and we can have also autonomous uh, regulation. And uh, this is a quotation by the book by Primavera uh, De Filippi. Uh, she says that, oh, okay, there is a problem about regulation. She's open uh, on this, but she says that uh, if you regulate too soon, okay, uh, you can give a valuable, a valuable guidance uh, as to the legitimate uses of blockchain technology, but could also stamp out potential benefits. So you can fix the situation <laughs> at the present moment. And, <clears throat> but if you regulate too late, uh, you can give room, for instance, to not very clear uh, economic operations, and the, uh, there is uh, no trust by the normal investors that are quite prudent. So, so uh, if this is the background, uh, we have some uh, initial regulation at the European level. The, this is a resolution of the Parliament uh, exactly on distributed ledger technologies and blockchains. Okay, and uh, what is interesting and uh, less known is that uh, there is also uh, something in the um, draft justice action plan for 2019-2023, and. No, too fast. And they uh, <coughs> consider the possibility to use blockchain for justice, even in, within the organization of uh, jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictional activity. And so what about Italy? It was uh, quoted yesterday. We have uh, an initial uh, re regulation in the, uh, this is a law, of February 2019, and it says that in the law is, is accepted in a very general sense the idea that smart contracts are or can be legal contracts. The critical point of this regulation, as was said yesterday, is that uh, they, uh, they want the government to, to enact some guidelines, but these guidelines are still in the mind of the government, okay? And we don't know. But the basic point is that uh, even for smart contract, the basic rule is the freedom of form. And, uh, and the freedom of contract is a basic freedom, unless you procure <laughs> damages to third parties. And so even without <laughs> guidelines, in my opinion, we can accept if there are all the other requisites that smart contracts can be legal contracts in the Italian, uh, um, in the Italian system. So if we go back to the, uh, this list of strategies, uh, in my view, we have to accept that there is no one strategy that has to prevail necessarily on the other. We can have a mix uh, of them because we, we need a general frame from uh, uh, 
point of view of state regulation, but on the other side, we do not have to uh, reduce, to under-evaluate the autonomous regulation. And in this light, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the kind of solution that was uh, proposed by JUR. Uh, JUR is a young uh, international organization in the field of smart contracts and, um, and blo blockchain. So they, they uh, consider uh, very carefully, um, very carefully, <clears throat> the importance of the system of solving the litigations that may uh, appear. So, there are cases where uh, smart contracts need dispute resolution. And what are these cases? When the uh, a smart contract, let's say, can be used also for purchasing real estate goods, okay? And in this case, it's possible that some problem uh, happens and also when the, the problem, the second uh, arrow, uh, when the problem uh, is, uh, they call it uh, subjective. So I would translate, it's a matter of interpretation, okay? And so arbitration has some benefits, uh, the benefit to be uh, speed, confidential, and potentially uh, in, independent from local jurisdiction. This is still the proposal uh, by Alessandro Palombo. We had here Alessandro and he can replicate if uh, something is not clear in this presentation. So, but there are also some flaws in the arbitration uh, system, normally existing in the world, let's say, of blockchain and smart contract. Be because sometimes the um, There is still a problem of costs. There is a problem of, uh, the problem of immediate enforceability that is a, a problem in this area. So and they make a different proposal. So the, the proposal is a, a proposal that should work uh, exactly uh, on the blockchain. And this is the proposal. We foresee the opportunity to deliver and non-decentralized, and this is a crucial point in the uh, in a world dominated by the idea of decentralized. No, this system is not decentralized. Uh, the act of judgment is not decentralized. So the arbitrators earn the same amount regardless of their decision. Once the judgment is made, the system executes a blind decentralized peer review. So it's a two-level de decision. First, you have a decision uh, taken by, uh, by arbitrators, judges, let's say, uh, and they remain anonymous, and uh, the reviewers, the peer review, do not know what is the, opini the opinion expressed by each of the, uh, the judges or of the, um, the panel, okay? And in this way, there is an ecosystem which ensures the quality of judgment with on the ongoing reviews, but at the same time respects a due process with a fully impartial third party judge. So there is a fully uh, autonomous uh, third party judge. There is also a motivation, an explanation of, a written explanation of the reason why they have decided in a way. And this is very important because this is normal in uh, state judiciary, <laughs> let's say, but in some of the solution existing in the, uh, on the web, uh, this point is uh, absolutely uh, missing. And so they say the final result is that you can have a blockchain enforcement, the enforcement within blockchain, or the state enforcement. The blockchain enforcement will work when you have uh, an escrow that is uh, given in advance uh, to the litigation. So the, the people, uh, parties of the litigation, uh, put the money in the 
uh, availability of the judges of the, of the panel in some sense, so that whatever the decision, the, the person who has the right to this quantity of goods, or money, or token, or what, uh, whatever, can realize it immediately, okay? And this is the situation where you have the, a blockchain, a really blockchain enforcement. In all other cases, uh, you have to go sooner or later to uh, local jurisdictions and state jurisdictions. So, I have some uh, questions and some points on this. So, uh, self-executing. What means self-executing? How self-executing? So, if the payment is made using goods already existing in, in the blockchain, okay, so this means that the owner has no possibility to use the amount of money or goods be before the, the decision. It, it is the system of the escrow, okay? Uh, escrow is a deposit in order to guarantee, is what we call pegno or in Italian or similar. Uh, and uh, of course, in this case, the escrow can be given also by a third party that is a guarantor for the e execution of the... Uh, but we have to consider also the possibility, this is the first option that they say this is a blockchain enforcement, very easy. But if we consider that the, the payment can be made, why not? Also, using goods not existing in the blockchain. So the problem uh, becomes, so does this mean that the person, the party, has no right to dispose of the amount of money before the, the end of the, uh, the arbitration? If yes, it, it means that uh, if you can dispose of the money, the money, uh, the execution is in danger, uh, of course. Otherwise, it is, again, a form of escrow, okay? And uh, let's consider the case of not self-executing part of the contract. So when it is a matter of interpretation. Yes, but the interpretation on what? Uh, interpretation can be the interpretation of the contract, the meaning of the contract, or about the facts, you know? If the, the goods have been delivered properly in a, a good shape a, a, and so on, uh, and this makes a difference because the interpretation of the contract, as uh, Alessandro Negri de la Torre uh, yesterday afternoon explained very well, the interpretation of the contract as a, a text having a meaning, okay, uh, is, is quite, maybe, maybe quite complicated because nobody, unless an expert, is able to, to read directly a contract written in code. No? If you see a code, oh, okay, fantastic, very good, <laughs> nice picture, okay, but you need some explanation in natural language. And there can be some disalignment be between the two. How we uh, regulate the relationship between, yes, two minutes and I'll finish. And so this is a problem of multilingualism within the same contract. In the same contract, you have a problem of multilingualism. Normally, when we talk about multilingualism, uh, think about, okay, we speak French, Italian, German, and so on. No, within the same contract, you have different languages, and you have to decide wh what, what is the language to refer to. So, and arbitration, there are different types. Uh, there is the jury proposal, but the, at the end of the story, it, with the exception of blockchain enforcement, in all other cases, you sign a new contract that is what we call in Italian arbitrato rituale, or resolution of the case according to a, a, new, a new agreement. And again, this agreement can be a new smart contract 
or can be a normal contract outside the blockchain, so we are in the legislation, general legislation. So, uh, my opinion is that, okay, what are these uh, <laughs> signs? So, uh, I try to, to put a limitation, a clear boundary between what is code, what is law, uh, and so on, but I discovered that it, it, it was not possible to, to, to draw a, a, clear, uh, a clear boundary. So, we, we have to accept the idea that for a certain period of time, we will have several entities that can work one time more on the side of code, another time more on the side uh, of law, in, let's say, in traditional terms. But we, I am not surprised of this. We shouldn't be surprised of this. The, this is the development of worldwide population. You can see the dramatic increase in the last centuries that are the centuries of technological development, industrial revolution, uh, and so on. So it's normal. More people, more contacts, more, more contracts, more litigations, and more uh, several different types of uh, dispute resolution. And so we have, uh, we will have law that is in computation, law expressing natural language, law that has to deal with multilingualism that is also formal natural multilingualism. And so. The global experience of law is broadening, and we have to accept everybody, everybody with a critical approach, but we have to accept everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Santos Osso. Thank you so much. So we have um, just now have seen a complete overview about the topics of blockchain. So we discussed the uh, almost, I think, every kind of critical point about this, this technology. And uh, I would like to ask you if you want to, to intervene with a question to, to Amedeo, or if you, um, there are some questions in, in the room, or we can go maybe, yeah, okay, in, in the end. And mm, thanks also for quoting uh, our proposal. And uh, uh, I think we can go with Pietro. Uh, I, I would like to, to engage Pietro with this question, sorry. Non ho sentito, scusate. Ah, una domanda. Uh, actually, let's ask Benedetta. So, at the end, or? Maybe we can okay. collect, yeah. we can collect Mindu, Ale, and answer at the end all together. So, thank you so much, and uh, very much. I'm glad to be here, Pietro, to, to introduce your, 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 your speech of today. Um, my question is, if, with regard of your presentation, is how are going to change the, the dispute resolution methods since, and how the markets, if we can discuss about markets with this regard, are going to change thanks to the emerge of this new technology, and which is your thought about that and uh, the, your forecast probably of the next year. So, um, please. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, well, thanks. A really warm thank you to Benedetta, to Professor Buschieri. It's really a honor to be here with you today. Uh, I want to reassure you, actually, the topic stays the same, so I think, actually, it does make sense to, to group our presentations together. I will try to answer your question, Alessandro, by uh, sharing with you what I have learned so far about this market, if markets can be the right word for dispute resolution services and how technology impacts on it. Well, you know, I am an arbitration person. That's what I teach. That's what my professional activity is about. And so I must confess, at the very beginning, when smart contracts started being discussed, and you have these recurring claims, oh, you lawyers will become obsolete, you know, key law lawyers, that's a thing that... Uh, comes back again and again through the history of mankind. I was quite annoyed by it because I thought, well, a smart contract follows an if-then logic, a deterministic logic, but a contract works as an intellectual construct because many aspects of it are non-deterministic, right? So there's a margin for interpretation, that's what Professor Santos also was referring to, that is inherent to how law works. 
So I thought, well, you can claim the lawyers will be obsolete, but in the end, disputes will arise and you will need lawyers. You will need this guy. And I put a photo of an English barrister because to me that is the epitome of non-deterministic artistic legal thinking, right? Um, and you will never do with us that easily. Um, that was my initial thought. And I must say that was really simplistic. Going into the topic, meeting people like Alessandro, like Raffaele, and thanks to events like this one, I realized that actually um, things are not as easy as they seem. In fact, even this slide is not as easy as it seems because I just lied to you. That's not even a real barrister. That's art actor Charles Lawton in the movie Witness for the Prosecution. Uh, so what did I learn so far? I started with a bet. I told myself, well, you know, Bitcoin was exploding. That was the first uh, example of blockchain. And I told myself, well, if people start using Bitcoin, you'll see in a number of years, you'll see Bitcoin disputes arising in court. You will see people bringing their contracts to court and asking for the protection of, rise, of rights arising out of a transaction denominated in Bitcoin, just like you do with any fiat currency. And so I started counting all court cases in the United States mentioning Bitcoin to show how this trend was going to grow. And I did it up until last year. I wrote a paper on that. Of course, we all know that the amount of transactions uh, verified on the Bitcoin blockchain has been exponentially growing. And I thought, well, court cases will grow too. That was my bet, to prove them wrong, to prove that lawyers would still be useful. And I lost it. I lost it quite spectacularly, actually, because there has been an increase, but a very timid increase of court cases mentioning Bitcoin. And even in those, there's a high number of false positives. Because first of all, many of these cases were criminal cases, cases where people, for example, used Bitcoin on the dark net. And that was not what I was interested in. I wanted to see court cases where somebody asked for the enforcement of a contract denominated in Bitcoin. There were some civil cases, of course, but even in those, there are some false positives. So in some cases, Bitcoin is mentioned as an example of a digital asset, for example, but the cause of action does not arise out of a contract denominated in Bitcoin. There were some of them, especially concerning mining equipment, but really a handful. Uh, and I started asking myself, why so few? Well, of course, a possible answer is that people buy Bitcoin but don't do anything with that. It's just speculation. But still, why so few? This is really too little. And I saw some years ago things that didn't really add up. For example, I saw Open Bazaar, that was still is uh, the uh, decentralized equivalent of eBay. It's uh, an e-commerce platform where people buy and sell stuff. Here you see a ski shop for, for snow sports equipment. Well, of course, in a decentralized environment, you don't have the platform that provides a dispute resolution service with the seller, like you have on Amazon, on eBay. So, of course, people must need to protect themselves, even in this niche, even if it's just a niche. That was a very beginning, and then I'll draw some general uh, lessons to answer your question and to tie up to Professor Santos Osso's presentation. Um, I went back to the Bitcoin white paper to try to answer that. Of course, I mean, many things remain unknown, including who uh, this Satoshi Nakamoto is or are, maybe. Uh, but there was one sentence that really struck me. The fact that, actually, the Bitcoin white paper is drafted having in mind a specific case study that is e-commerce. And it says a very mysterious sentence. It says, routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. So although many people have ignored this aspect of the white paper, from the very beginning, actually, the Bitcoin white paper is a white paper about arbitration based on an escrow. It's a white paper about self-enforcing arbitration. And that's what actually happened on Open Bazaar. You didn't have a simple transfer of funds from the wallet to the buyer to the wallet of the seller. Typically, you use the multi-signature address. That is a special type of Bitcoin address that works like a lock with two keyholes. So buyer and seller are both provided with a key, but by itself, one key is not enough to free the funds. So the coins are stored, the price of the transaction or the purchase is stored in this particular type of address. If the transaction runs smoothly, 
the product, the, the goods, will be delivered to buyer, and the parties will agree to use their keys and uh, free the funds in favor of the seller. That is the escrow mechanism that Professor Santos Rosso was referring to. But what if a dispute arises? If a dispute arises in these very rudimentary systems that we have, and we had, especially in the beginning with Bitcoin, you have the possibility of appointing one arbitrator that will hold another key and will conduct a dispute resolution procedure, at the outcome of which he or she will give the key to the winning party. Which means not only this arbitrator will be able to make an arbitral award, she will be able to enforce the award which is very interesting, of course, because traditionally enforcement is the monopoly of the state. It's the state's monopoly over the use of force. That in this niche kind of comes to an end now. So for example, in this case, the arbitrator finds in, fi in favor of buyer, and the keys are used to give the price, the money, back to the buyer. Subject to the provision, as Professor Santos also was saying, that this must be an asset stored on the blockchain, in this case, a, a sum of money, essentially, a sum of tokens. Interestingly, there is a certain dispute resolution market for uh, arbitrators. Here's a platform where people promote their dispute resolution services, and you see somebody that has over 800 reviews for uh, successful dispute resolution uh, procedures that they have conducted, which is a lot. I don't know any arbitrator that has done 800 arbitrations in, in real life, actually. But of course, that was just the beginning. That is a proof of concept. It shows that you can have self-enforcement. But in practice, however, this can percolate in different forms of arbitration. And what we are seeing now with projects such as JOR is a way more sophisticated way of using this technology. Well, here you see that uh, multi-signature address addresses are used, actually, it's, it's a lot of money stored in these type of addresses. But how do these general tools, these very rudimentary tools, have, how have they evolved recently and how can they penetrate in different types of arbitration? I think there's actually a fragmentation of the market at the moment. So on the one hand, you have traditional arbitration, the one that leads to res judicata. And in that case, probably self-enforcement is not the way to go because it's based on an escrow that is uh, incompatible with high-value transactions most of the times. But still, I think these technologies can be used as important case management tools. And there's a lot to be improved in that respect. But that is a traditional type of arbitration. I put the PCA because it's probably the most traditional uh, arbitration forum, and it's close to where I live, so I like to see a photo of it. But there's also other stuff. For example, the so-called swarm types of arbitration, like JOR, for example, where a community of users can stake tokens to decide the correct resolution of a certain dispute on the basis of a certain amount of game theoretical incentives. That is a completely new type of dispute resolution that not necessarily will qualify as arbitration from the point of view of state law, but they might still have a fundamental practical effect of responding a demand for dispute resolution that so far has been completely unmet because for high volume, low value transactions, you cannot really use any of the traditional dispute resolu resolution mechanisms. So to go back to my initial contention against smart contracts killing lawyers, I think we can have a provisional map of different systems of dispute resolution. So on the one hand, you might have deterministic enforcement. That is to say, the if-then logic in some cases might be enough. But for all the cases where you need a certain amount of human interaction, of human interpretation, of artistic lawyering, so to say, there's also a lot more than you can do. They're just going to court to traditional arbitration. So on the one hand, in some cases, the smart contract might be enough. Think of, for example, disputes arising out of um, flight refund claims. Nowadays, many times, uh, carriers just say, no, sorry, uh, we're not going to pay because it's force majeure, even if it's not. If you had a smart contract, that would kill most of those disputes, of course. But in terms of non-deterministic enforcement, you no lo longer have only the traditional arbitration. You also have an adjudication based on escrow, 
accounts, like the case of Bitcoin that Nakamoto mentions in his white paper, and you have these new systems of adjudication that are not necessarily based on a panel of arbitrators, and Jure is a wonderful case in point, but I'm not going to talk about it because I'm on the panel with Alessandro, so it's, it would be like talking about electric cars and I'm on the panel with Elon Musk. It's not very smart on my side, right? Um, all of these things are different, so we shouldn't think that they necessarily compete with each other. I think they serve different purposes and they cover different niches of the market. Because the purpose, in the case of smart contracts, is just dispute avoidance, to kill some disputes that should have never arisen in the first place. In the case of traditional arbitration, of course, it's dispute resolution. It's something that will lead you to essentially a res judicata effect. And in these other mechanisms, I would say it's something in between. It's something that might not give you a judicata, but still gives you a stability that's way higher than just the initial allocation of resources given by a smart contract. And again, the effect is very different. If you have an initial, initial allocation of resources, you can basically relitigate it or arbitrate it de novo. And the smart contract will be just an agreement between the parties, if any, if it is a legal smart contract. Otherwise, it might be completely disregarded. In the case of arbitration, you will have finality. So, of course, in that case, in this column, I think due process is very important because that's all you have. In the case of these new mechanisms, of course, that remains to be seen. In some cases, it might be still something that can be relitigated de novo, but I think if certain types of guarantees are respected, it could be something that leads to a binding result, even though not necessarily a legally enforceable result. Like, for example, in the case of it Italian law, the arbitrato rituale, in the case of Dutch law, the binden ad vis, in the case of English law, the uh, expert determination. Um, so it is an increasingly fragmented market, and what I like about it is that we can meet more demands that we have never met so far. I will leave you with a quote that hopefully will spark uh, some curiosity and questions on your side from, I think, one of the greatest writers of the last century, Ursula Le Guin, who in 1969 writes something really uh, stunning in how modern it is. She writes, legends of prediction are common throughout the whole household of man. God speaks, spirits speak, computers speak, and she writes this in 1969. It's quite impressive, I think. Oracular ambiguity or statistical probability provides loopholes and discrepancy are expunged by faith. So already in 1969, she's basically telling us deterministic thinking based, based on an if-then logic will leave some gaps. And those gaps will need to be filled with something that's inherently human. And she calls it faith. But faith in what? Well, of course, you're free to believe in whatever you want. But I do invite you, because we are mainly lawyers in the room, to keep believing in the enduring power of the law to get the job done. Thanks. Thanks, Pietro, for Thanks, Peter, for the great um, presentation of today. And uh, so we started today with uh, Professor Santos Oso, and we touched with him all the critical points regarding blockchain and related topics. We came through this analysis of Pietro, which has been really interesting for the, the angles that he took. And now we agreed with uh, Jean to go, um, he's working on the history of computer science and also on philosophy. So I think it can be quite interesting to, to close this um, panel having a broader overview with a more wide question, which is um, why so recently these two different sciences, which would be apparently far, which is computer technology, computer science, sorry, and uh, law, recently has become so, so close. So uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the nice thing about, about talking late is that uh, I've heard colleagues, uh, the bad thing of course is that uh, I, I will repeat a number of things that you've heard already, but maybe, maybe it's not a dis disadvantage, it's, it's also nice to, to make uh, connections. 
So yeah, I'm a philosopher and historian of computer science, but I came across uh, legal issues rather recently by working with a judge in, in Paris. And um, so th the basic point I would like to make this morning is um, the rather hidden connection between contemporary legal systems, computation, and the history of writing. So this is, this is something that maybe you didn't think of, but uh, computing and writing are very close uh, activities. And uh, I think that um, what we are facing in law today um, can be clarified if we make this historical detour. Um, uh, and uh, I, will, I will try to show that um, uh, the revolution of, uh, taking place today is in fact both a revolution but also has a very, very long history. So this is, this is the, the point I want to make. Um, so I have, I have to uh, first, uh, my first claim will be that uh, computer science is the latest step in the very long history of writing. So this is rather strangely put, but I will start by, by trying to, to argue uh, this, this claim by going back to the history of reading in antiquity and of writing in the 20th century. And I won't talk about things in between, but I mean, this is only a short presentation. So um, uh, let's start with, with linguistic signs. As you know, linguistic signs uh, have two sides. One is uh, the material side, either vocal or written, and the meaningful side, the conceptual side. And the two sides are completely inextricable, uh, in natural languages at least. Uh, and this is where writing comes uh, into the picture because through the history of writing, these two sides of signs were slowly distinguished from one another. And so uh, it became clear that we could distinguish between the material and the meaningful side of signs. And this is not a natural fact. This is a historical construction in the West especially. So um, I want to, I, I will show you that in a moment. And this has consequences uh, on computer science because my second claim will be that what happened in the 30s of the 20th century, uh, the, the birth of uh, computer science and more specifically of programming, uh, partly inherited from what happened in antiquity. So there is a way of connecting antiquity and the, and the modern world uh, and the, 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 this connection is related to the automati automatization of uh, the reading and the writing of signs. So the, the point I want to make is this. In the West, the history of writing is the history of automatization of reading first and then of writing. So if, if I go back to antiquity, I will, I will just sketch in three steps what happened. We started in Mesopotamia uh, in 3300 BC. So this is 54 centuries ago. Uh, we've been writing for a very long time in the West. And uh, writing was invented to re record both languages and numbers. So we, we, we can't forget the number part because we're fascinated by, by the fact that writing, you know, is, is uh, meant to, to record language, but it's not the case. Right from the beginning, it was possible to represent both words for entities and words for numbers. So that's the, the first step, Mesopotamia. The second step, which is also something big, is the invention of the alphabet in Semitic languages. Um, you know that the Semitic languages uh, like Hebrew and, and Arabic, for example, have a very specific type of alphabet, which is called abjad, uh, uh, according to the order of the first letters of the, the, uh, the Arabic alphabet. And it was a tremendous reduction of the number of signs, since in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia you had like 200 or 250 signs to 
to use, and you have only 22 signs in, in, the, in, in the Semitic uh, alphabet. So there's an incredible feat uh, that has to do with the recording of purely acoustic phenomena, so the material side of sign. And um, what is really interesting is the fact that uh, in these alphabets, uh, only consonants are written down, which means that the reader has, has to put the vowels at the right place to be able to read. For example, if I give you an example in Arabic, uh, you will have um, a, a, a root like KTB, and then you will have to put kataba, which means library, kitab, which is uh, the book, or katib, which is uh, the writer. And, and so you, if, if you put the vowels at the right place, you will be able to make sense of what you read. So there is the active uh, participation of the reader in order to, to get back to the meaning of, of what has been written. And this, um, this is important because this is precisely what disappears in the third step uh, in antiquity with the invention of the Greek alphabet. In the Greek and the Latin alphabet uh, afterward, afterwards, um, you write both vowels and consonants, as you know. So, in fact, um, this process of reading is potentially mechan mechanizable. It can be automated. Well, let's, let's, let's give an example. When, you, when I'm in bed, tired at night, I'm reading a page, you know, I can read a whole page, and then in the end I say, but, but what, what I, it doesn't make sense. You know, uh, I've been reading for two minutes and uh, I have no idea what, what, what I've been doing. And this is, this is because the alphabet allows me to read in a totally automatic way. You know, we, we, can, we can make a clear-cut distinction between the material side that you can scan, you know, like this, like a machine, and, and, and the meaning of words. And this was not true in, in, in the other kinds of, of alphabets. So the history of writing in antiquity ends up with the Greek alphabet, which manages to separate in the linguistic signs two sides, the material one and the meaningful one, and this is potentially mechanizable. And this is very, very important uh, because this is something that we will find in the 20th century and I'm going to talk about this now. So what happened in the 20th century is, uh, is in fact something that happened in the history of mathematics. And uh, if you, if you, there are also three steps that you can, that you can uh, devise. Um, and what, what, what is at the heart of automization in the 20th century is not the reading process that was done by the Greek. It's the writing process. So the writing process can be automized. You know, in, in one of your slides you said, if then, else, which means that there are loops in programs that doesn't need your, your participation. You know, it, it goes on automatically. And this is, this is very new. So I will, I will very quickly sketch the three steps. The first one is Hilbert. So Hilbert was a uh, German mathematician of the 20s. Uh, and uh, Hilbert managed, managed to, to, in fact, write some kind of alphabet for all mathematical propositions. So you could, you could actually use formal graphic signs that would represent mathematical propositions. By doing so, you leave the meaning of propositions outside and you concentrate on the graphic signs that you use. And this was a means to avoid uh, paradoxes with the infinite. I, I won't get into this, it's, it's a long story. What, what I want to stress is just that Hilbert managed to, to write the alphabet that is used in formal mathematics to represent all kinds of propositions. The second step is, uh, is uh, Gödel, you know, this uh, Austrian uh, logician, uh, and, and Gödel said, well, if we have this alphabet um, totally uh, 
disconnected from meaning, we can also give numbers to these, to, to, to these marks. And so we can compute on, on purely numbers. That's the second step. And the third step is, is Alan Turing, the British mathematician, who said, well, if there's a way to represent mathematical propositions by graphic tokens, and if these tokens can be actually represented by numbers, well, we have a way of programming. So programming will just be automization of, uh, of the combination of these marks. So this is, this is really important uh, because the, the birth of uh, programming languages in the 30s uh, is, is uh, very much here today when we talk about, uh, about law. So what, what Turing did was in fact write the first programming language, but he also managed to show that, that computing uh, by this machine he invented, the Turing machine, which is a purely uh, idealized machine, mathematical machine, this, this machine cannot compute all possible numbers. There are numbers that, are, that cannot be computed, which is very strange, you know. If, if, if I tell you there are uncomputable numbers, what, what, what is that? You know, what, what is an uncomputable number? Well, he had a logical proof to show that you know, there are numbers that can be computed and there are numbers that can't be computed. And this is why it's a, it's, it's a mathematical concept. It's because you can, you can circumscribe the perimeter where computing is possible. And you can also show that this, this, this is a, 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 some kind of a, a dimension which, is, which has another dimension which is uncomputable. So the combination of alphabetic writing and number computing is not powerful enough to describe all that takes place as far as processes are concerned. And I think this is very important when, when we'll be talking about law. Um, what is also interesting by inventing programming languages, you also, you also need people to be able to, to understand what they do and and these are computer scientists. So what, what is really fascinating, I think, is the fact that um, we don't know, I mean, you and me, uh, because we're not computer scientists, we don't know exactly what happened by, w when we use software. So we have, we, we have graphic signs, but we're totally illiterate. So we are in a very strange situation, you know. This is the last step in the history of writing, but we can't read. We can't read anymore, you know? And I think this is the main problem when, when justice comes about, is that uh, a judge has to use a, uh, a piece of software without exactly knowing what he does. And, and of course, this, is, this has many consequences on the rule of law. So I will, I will, go, I will go there now. So digital law, what, what is digital law? Well, I think it's, it's some kind of, of contradiction uh, because, um, well, at least it's problematic because the expression brings together two kinds of legality. On the one hand, where you have the classical, legal, uh, mostly Roman, actually, tradition of, of legal systems that are written in texts that are readable. You know, that's what you were talking about this morning. So there is some kind of rule of, te rule of texts, in a way. And now we also have the coding, which means pieces of software that we can't read, and that there are, which encode numbers representing propositions. So these pieces of software are logical algorithms that are out of space. I think that the expression cyberspace is very bad, you know. There is no cyberspace. There is it's just logical rules, that's all. And it's out of space. So we have rule of text, which is the traditional laws, and we have rule of code. And how, how does that, you know, how does that coexist? Because we, we have readable text, you've been spending all your youth uh, reading um, uh, legal texts, but of course uh, you, you, 
you, you're not uh, computer specialists, so you are now facing situations where you have to rely on software to, uh, to do your job. So, so the digitalization of law, today at least, mainly consists in an operation of translation, and that's also what, what you did this morning. We, we have, we have multilingualism in, in, in contracts because part of them are codes, but of course the code in itself is not readable, so we need explanations in, in natural language, so we need to use law again, and it's a very complicated situation. So how, how do we deal with this? Well, I think that the problem is, is to reintegrate this, the piece of software which is out of space, purely algorithmic, in some kind of spatial uh, environment where it is meaningful for humans and where, of course, um, uh, law and, and conflicts are, are concerned. So how do, we make, how do we make the code readable? That's the big question. And we also addressed this question this morning uh, in, in, uh, in the plenary um, today. Um, you know that some legal professions are, are living today some kind of near-death experience. I mean, uh, I'm thinking of bailiffs or solicitors. You know, if, if you can replace um, bailiffs by, by you know, taking, taking a pick uh, which is uh, localized and horodated, uh, and if it costs you uh, 2.5 euro, uh, why, why would you go and ask a bailiff uh, to, 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 to write a report on, on, on what happened? You know? So there are jobs that are really, really in danger. I think that, that um, the danger will be overcome by hybridization. So we, we need to make people work together, engineers and, and jurists at the same time. So now blockchain, just in very few, um, you know, in, in my, my last words will be for blockchain. I think blockchain is a purely written phenomenon. So it, it presupposes a word, a world, which is reduced to uh, digital components, uh, which are governed by purely deterministic uh, processes. But we know that this is not this is not natural. You know, since uh, since the 30s and the, the what Turing uh, proves, we know that there are uncomputable uh, numbers, and we know that there are uncomputable processes, both in nature and in in, in society. So. Um, I, I think that the, w the world of blockchain is limited and must be limited because it must be reintegrated in a world that makes sense. And what, is, what makes sense is uh, situations in space and in natural languages. That's exactly uh, what Anna uh, showed this morning. You know, you, 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 you can of course map the earth completely. Okay, but but of course uh, this is not enough. This is not enough to 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 make to make a judgment. So so I think that that blockchain for the moment is certainly the next step in 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 the history of writing uh, as far as uh, legal code is is concerned. But um, it it cannot be used alone. It has to be used in in a broader context. And I think that's what Primavera said yesterday too. So my conclusion, uh, very quickly, uh, is just two points. First of all, that the, the rule of law today inherits a long history of writing since antiquity, uh, which is focused on the automatization through alphabetic and number procedures. That's the first uh, thing. And the second thing is that uh, accountability cannot be a, a pure uh, computing process. Even if we don't know how far we can go with the algorithms, we know that there is a limit. And, and, and this is, of course, something that uh, we have to discuss uh, every time there is a conflict. Where is the limit? Where do we want to, to use algorithms? Where we don't want to use algorithms? And where we want to go back to natural language? and, uh, and uh, normal way of speaking.
So, thank you so much, Jean, for this complete, um, let's say, um, really full overview from you know the beginning to to do to nowadays. I have a few questions for every one of our amazing um, speaker of today, but I would like to leave you uh, the, the chance to interact. Uh, if um, don't be shy, I know that there is a, a already a question in uh, the first row, but I think. Oh. <laughs> Um, no, 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 but, oh, thank you so much, <laughs> thank you so much. And other guys in the, in the room, do you want, do you have to, some, some questions or uh, do you want to share some thoughts with the panelists of today? Because uh, I, w I will try to break the highs and to, to um, oh, yeah, sorry, it's, okay. It's better, okay. So I will start now to probably with Jean, uh, since the topic we, we discussed is with him is quite different from you know the typical blockchain legal speech. And I have, uh, therefore, I have a kind of original question for him. So uh, we discussed it, Jean, about all the mm, you know probably the separation between the uh, material and the meaning of the of the word, right? So. Yeah. Um, my question to you is that there is a huge trend in legal technology related, I would say, which is legal design. I think that every one of you like legal design, so it's like the apple of legal technology because, as you know, probably when you want to make some legal text much clearer and attractive, today we are discussing as lawyers, as innovators, about legal design. So my question for you is, since your background is quite, you know, I think y you can provide a few wise thoughts on that. So is how do you see legal design in the innovation path and also with regard probably with coding? Because I think that you, 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 you told before, you know, uh, the code must be understood. And if you want to understand the code, you have to interpret. So how do you want to connect this? Yeah, it's a, bi it's a big question, of course. Uh, uh, I, I think that... Um, uh, this is why I talked about hybridization. You know, we need uh, we need uh, various competences to be able to build uh, pieces of software that we can use. Um, there are many initiatives. I I'm thinking of uh, uh, colleagues in in Belgium um, who um, try to initiate uh, people who are illiterate in in computer science. Uh, by asking them the right questions, for example, about transportation, you know, uh, and, and then tr try to build up uh, the right software to, to answer these, uh, their, their particular needs. So I think, I, I think that, uh, uh, of course, nobody can, can now master uh, um, the, uh, the industry of, of, uh, of computer science and, and computer programming. But what we can do is, of course, make sure that the right experts uh, work together. You know, and uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is fundamental. This is, I mean, this is the future of law. Can I interact about <coughs> uh, about legal design? As uh, the, your question assumes that uh, legal design is another language, okay? Because <laughs> you are comparing uh, coding, natural language, and legal design. Yeah. Your provocation is uh, here. Okay, but uh, I think that legal design is uh, an excellent uh, idea in order to improve the, the level of communication be between the lawyers, the clients, the people, uh, the whole, uh, etc. But it can be also misleading. E even a representation can be mis misleading. <laughs> so the representation that our friend Margaret Hagan does in uh, her books uh, and, and so on are uh, by purpose very uh, naive hmm? uh, with sometimes also some typos uh, and, and so on. Uh, okay, she is thinking uh, doing so to the poor people's uh, Hispanic that in the United States have no access to lawyers because the United States have the paradox of having a huge quantity of lawyers and people without legal assistance, okay? <laughs> and uh, legal design uh, uh, 
tries to, <laughs> to, uh, to fill this gap. Okay, <clears throat> but I, I don't know if you have any experience of the um, uh, insert of Corriere della Sera, La Lettura, that for sometimes uh, they make two pages of visual graphics. I close, I go another page, because I want, I want to, to spend one word for the, for the nice word written in Times New Roman. Okay, that is boring, but it's clear sometimes. So, and what is true for legal design is true also for coding. In the sense that, of course, coding is a formal language that only the experts can uh, understand, mm -hmm. but can be translated, can be explained. And if we want to uh, accept this kind of uh, activity, we have to improve the level of knowledge of coding, what coding is, sometimes it's like a metaphysical entity. It, it is quite strange <laughs> for, for normal people, but it is not uh, something impossible to understand, at least in the, its basic logic, okay? So we have to increase the level of knowledge in the population, and the, what is coded should be explained also in, uh, in other ways. So we have to increase the traffic between the things. Whatever the, uh, the language we use, legal design or codes or natural language. Yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah um, I completely agree with you. But I mean, there is a third party in this, which is the state. Uh, the state cannot disappear as such. He, you know, the, the state, it, has, it has to decide which software to use, which, which is the right one. In, in, in the, so uh, I think that the idea you know, this anarchist idea that we could get rid of the state is, is just illusory. This is, this is not the case. So in order to bridge the gap, as, as, uh, as we, we just said, um, I think that the state has, has a great role to play, at least in Europe. So I would say that um, uh, there should be so, so, some, some instance at the European level that will guarantee that some pieces of software can be used in court. And this is not done, but I think it's, it's, it should be uh, very quickly. Otherwise, it, it'll be some kind of wild jungle where anybody can use anything. And, and I mean, where is the equality before the law in that case? translated or incorporated in this new numerical code, yeah. something that stay outside yeah. what it is and how is it possible. Uh, I'm not a, a mathematician, yeah. but I thought that you can give a number uh, in the infinity. So yeah. wh what stay out? And well, if it stay out, where does it go? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a very good question. It's very difficult to answer in, in simple words. Uh, but but uh, if you can, uh, I, will, I will just make some kind of hint to an answer with, without being formal. But if you can list 
all mathematical problems the way Hilbert did, you know, then where is where where is the 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 the, the, the engine that produces the list itself? Is it in the list or out of the list? You can't answer this question. So if you can if you can put a number to each mathematical problem, then you can't put a number on the way you write the list. See what I mean? So it's a nine it's it's some kind of in, in an indirect way of saying that there are numbers that can't be computed. Well, I mean we, we can we can discuss that. No, but, but <laughs> You should switch on the switch on the mic. In mathematics and in physics, um, my my daughter studied physics, uh -huh. statistic physics. Yeah. She told me that there are some statements that that you can demonstrate. You have to accept them. So numbers. Well, I mean, we, 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 we didn't manage I mean, this, to solve them. There's there's a very famous uh, Italian mathematician who is working on that today who is uh, Giuseppe Longo, uh, and uh, so he, he tries to show how this uncomputability has, has also, uh, should be linked to problems both in physics and uh, in biology. There are processes in physics that are chaotic and cannot be computed, just as it is uh, the case in biology too. So the, 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 the growing form cannot be computed uh, uh, and, and so he, he shows that, that uh, what I just uh, sketched in, in logic has also a counterpart in the physical world. And I would say there's also a counterpart in the social world. So if, if you have uncomputable processes in physics, why shouldn't there be uh, un, uh, uncountable uh, processes in, in society? No. <laughs> it's a work in progress. I'm working on that. So I think maybe just maybe just a um, few more minutes for the last questions, and then I think we can uh, we can uh, um, come to the conclusions of this amazing um, conference. Uh, are there any further questions or? Well, um, I think Amadeo Jean had the chance So one really last question from, from my side. I, I took uh, uh, quite a lot, so I, I will select just, just one because I was reading uh, mostly all of them actually. Uh, so by night I, I read sometimes. So and Pietro actually uh, wrote a lot about arbitration and blockchain. So um, he's going really straightforward in, and of course a really simple answer is going to be the future of justice private. Is going to be the future of justice decentralized? Well, of course, it's a very big question to answer, but what I think is that what we have learned is that one size does not fit all. So you cannot have one dispute resolution mechanism that resolves all of the disputes you have. Uh, some things are fit for court, some things are fit for traditional arbitration, which costs a lot, but it's a great service if it's worth it. Other types of disputes have never found their resolution, and now they can through these technologies. So I think what, you, what the future is, is a more sophisticated market where different actors tend to different needs of different types of users. And it's not that productive to recast this in the traditional you know, debate of, oh, court versus arbitration, people should go to court, or people know everything should be privatized. Different things will find different uh, outlets and different uh, responses to their need for justice but the need is there and we can that is new I think respond to the demands better than we've ever done in the past and that I think is quite exciting for a dispute resolution academic sure
right. The change looked like a garden, and then the police pays a brief balance, uh, right. and then uh, and then the car is chewed and goes over. And uh, um, a second was the father to decide what the item there is. Now you have mentioned the necessity of the secrecy, meaning. Uh, Of course, you understand this. We take a couple of hours of, of debate to iron out. Uh, I will just mention a couple of points. Because there are different types of arbitration, technology can have a different effect on how arbitrators are appointed. Even in a very traditional arbitration setting, like, for example, ICC arbitration, now through technology, you can create platforms for rating of arbitrators, for, such as, for example, the one of arbitrator intelligence, as is new. Uh, initiative, and that gives an unprecedented transparency on who are the arbitrators and how they perform. Even in this very traditional setting, there are other settings like JUR, for example, where everybody can be an arbitrator by staking tokens, and actually there's no fixed panel. So of course, it's a universe of different types of arbitration, and in each of them, technology has a different impact on how um, the panel is selected. If there is a predetermined panel at all, there might not be a predetermined panel at all. As to the point of confidentiality. Well, there's a stereotype that arbitration is always confidential. That is not really true. It's really sector specific. For example, maritime arbitration is never confidential. Investment arbitration, as you mentioned, nowadays is mostly not confidential, either because of the transparency rules or because people leak stuff. There are still some confidential cases, but there's a strong push towards transparency. As for the demand of justice that has never been met so far, let's say high volume, low value consumer disputes, you have to consider that what you have now is not a transparent court procedure. What you have now, at best, is a platform that acts as a judge, and you will never know how they resolve their disputes. And, you know, Amazon resolves 60 million of those a year. How do they perform these tasks? You, you'll never know. That is really opaque. In that sense, I think, a, you know, a relatively transparent dispute resolution system like JOR, for example, has a window opportunity to make us scrutiny to a certain extent what is happening there, way more than we have today. And again, Obviously, from the point of view of public guarantees, it would be wonderful if everything would be decided after two hearings of public hearing, uh, two weeks of public hearing. You cannot do it for everything. So one size, again, does not fit all. And our conception of transparency should be very sector specific, I think. Taking for granted, transparency is very important. Oh, sure. Oh, two questions more. Fantastic. Okay. Please, uh, maybe, uh, I, unfortunately, the mobile one is not working, so, yeah, it's working. No, no, Thank you, over there, if you could okay. come over. Yeah, yeah, sorry, but the maximum we can do. Maybe I can. If I may suggest, maybe we can collect uh, in this round both his question, your question, and maybe a few more, and we, we can debate all together, so we get you know faster, more. Hmm? Yes, coming back to this uh, system of um, taking decision made by 
arbitrators that decide independently without being in contact with one of the, other, of the other. This is very exciting on one side, but I see a very other dark side. Uh, it means that a single arbitrator that has to decide based on, uh, as I understood, on a system of incentives and of penalties, in my opinion, will always tend to opt for the standard de decision, for the fear of losing money if he goes against the majority. And so this, this system may tend or will tend to, let's say, homologation of decision with, with no room anymore for creativity, which is, I think, the lymph of our work as lawyer, as interpreters of law. So at the end of the day, where's the difference between this kind of system of decision and, for example, AI decision making? This was my, my concern that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you very much. I was really impressed also by, by this wonderful planet. Of, sorry. <laughs> so thank you again. I was really also very much impressed about your panel. <laughs> um, and uh, I was asking myself, uh, um, since we have been talking a lot about uh, blockchain technology, in, uh, especially with, within transactions, but being, being also a system of decisions, <laughs> decision making, um, how do you see it in other fields of civil law, like in family law, or have you came across <laughs> uh, examples of uh, the potential use of blockchain in, uh, in, in these fields, even for justice? I will be very brief. As to the incentives that uh, participants to a swarm arbitration system have to decide in one way or another, Alessandro, you're the best person to, to reply. There's a very complex theory behind it. What I can tell you is that because I'm very interested in it, we are organizing with our students a test of the platform where they will act as arbitrators in fake cases and we will see how they behave. So I think eventually to study this stuff, there's nothing better than see how it works in practice. Uh, the incentives are way more complicated than just I go with the majority and I gain tokens. It, it doesn't work like that, but that's how far I can go with the, with the description. As for family and other sectors, of course, that's outside of my specific area of expertise. But what I can tell you from uh, my brief comparative experience is that when it comes to the resolution of family disputes, in many jurisdictions, there's a massive access to justice problem. There's a massive legal aid problem. And for this reason, legal tech can be really useful. For example, in the Netherlands, where legal uh, consultancy is extremely expensive, uh, legal tech instruments have been created to help people draft their settlement agreements. Uh, it looks like a big brother type of thing, but it's way better than writing it by yourself without any type of legal education. Again, it's far from optimal, but it's a way to resolving the problem without saying, well, we should just give more money for legal aid, which would be great, but sometimes money is not there. Yeah. I will get the chance to really quickly answer to the question, which is absolutely appreciated. I mean. To, to both of them. So on the first question, which is about the incentives and the, 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 the fear, which, which is absolutely reasonable, I totally agree with that. So just to clarify, I don't want to speak about Jure, but any model which involves this kind of incentives related to the ability to anticipate the majority uh, must be really carefully um, used. In our case, we will use that for what we call micro-justice, so micro-transactions, no deals above $500. So if you ask me, do you want the decisions-making procedures are going to be homologated and no minority, let's say, report or differentiating opinion can be issued by decision makers in case this is the only condition to ensure a fast justice for $500, $200 or $8 of micro decisions about a 
Pakistan-based deals between two small freelancers, my answer would be we could accept that if it works, and that, that's why we have statisticians, um, physics work with us. So absolutely right, we don't think this is the right model for the real problems. That's why, and I'm com coming back to the second part of the questions, but it's our approach, so maybe you will find someone who think different about that. When you mm, go with the real arbitration, I think that the blockchain should be an enabler for exactly transparency and totally the opposite of being crypto. So what I want to clarify also with family law uh, regard is that what we, for example, are working on, but ideally in the future also other projects, is we don't use blockchain for everything. We use blockchain exactly in these three parts of an online procedure in which is strictly needed for ensuring better quality, non-corruptibility and transparency. So selection of the arbitrators, decentralized peer review, and the performance bond in case of attempt of corruption. This is the flow. So about family law and blockchain, I would ask you back, uh, what about family law and digital arbitration? Do you think that an online conference can, is able to ensure a uh, uh, well uh, understanding of the problem by a judge, if the answer is yes, and for me is not yes, probably uh, my answer as well would be yes. So I think this should be the angle. I would like to probably close the uh, thank you Benedetta for the organization and I think when always you know a conference goes really high it's a really good sign. Thanks again to Professor Santososo, Jean and Pietro Ortolani. Okay.